China Watch Radio is brought to you in part by Sushi Market Sprouts on 7th in Santa Cruz and Kaito in the Capitola Mall Food Court. Treat yourself to the finest Japanese cuisine you'll find anywhere with fresh sushi to go and delicious ramen dinners. Sushi Market Sprouts and Kaito. Yum! And welcome to a matter of face edition of China Watch Radio. Uh, today we have Susan Simon on the boards. We have John T. Collier up in the trees. We have Bill Graff here who's drinking guava juice. It might be strange. John T. in the trees? David Welch here, and yours truly, Michael Olson. And we are off. Ladies and gentlemen, when it rains, it pours. And it's not raining around here, but it is most certainly raining in China. And not only is it raining water, it's raining news by the buckets full. Yeah. And today we have buckets full of news out of China. We're going to pick them up and, and uh, pour them out on the table and see what's in that bucket. And later in the show, we're going to take on the really big issue, of course, and that is the visit by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to the Republic of Taiwan. And uh, we're going to ask the big question of the day, which is, who is winning face and who is losing face with Pelosi's trip to Taiwan? But the first segment, the first half hour, we're going to go through the stories we have for you today. Billy, what do you have on the table today? We stand with China, of course. Uh, we're talking about Russia. Woo. Dave Welch. We're going to talk about the collapsing Chinese economy resulting in lower oil prices. Wow. And I'm going to pick up our good friend Anthony, Anthony Fauci, who is still <laughs> funding the bugs research over in China uh, with the PLA. And Jaunty, what do you have up, up, up for you today, up there in the trees? Well, given all of China's economic headwinds at the moment, um, I'm going to discuss whether or not the Chinese dream is over. Uh, the YouTube channel Serpent ZA seems to think it is. I'll go over some of his arguments. Okay, we got a plate full for the first half hour. Billy Graff, take it away. All right. Well, as you mentioned, Mrs. Pelosi has visited Taiwan. And as everyone expected, it's caused a little bit of a ruckus. Uh, now, amidst all of that uh, travel and whatnot, uh, Russia has stepped up to the microphone and said, well, you know, we stand with China. Um, and Beijing has now imposed trade sanctions on Taiwan. That's just the headline, <laughs> okay? There's a lot going on. Now, um, you, you may have uh, seen that Mrs. Pelosi left Taiwan. She, she flew in, said hello, met with the leaders, and then flew to South Korea. How long was she there? I don't know, about an hour and a half. No, I, I, I think it was more like six hours, but she wasn't there very long. Enough to... Fly the flag. Fly the flag and to uh, make China try to save face. Is basically my interpretation of this. Now, uh, China has halted the export of natural sand to Taiwan after uh, Nancy Pelosi showed up uh, on the island. Uh, sanctions were imposed on Taiwan rather quickly. Uh, Russia has now said they stand with China. All of this happened in a matter of about two or three hours, actually. Uh, Taiwan's Council of Agriculture uh, had later had earlier uh, confirmed that China uh, halted exports, including producers of tea leaves, fruits, cocoa beans, vegetables, and some other things, including uh, uh, about 700 fishing vessels uh, have been have been looked at uh, as transporting fishing vessels. Taiwan's Taiwan's Taiwan's. So all of this went down, and, and here's the interesting thing. After Mrs. Pelosi arrived in Taiwan, uh, she reaffirmed an unwavering American commitment to Taiwan's democracy. You referred to uh, Taiwan in, in your opening statement today as the Republic of Taiwan, which is 
how most of the world views Taiwan, all, <laughs> all except mainland China. So, uh, and there, Russia. And Russia now. So what we have here is a, uh, the first salvo uh, of our program today, um, pointing to the fact that, that communist China, red China, as some of us like to refer to it for the ease of uh, uh, expediency, I guess, is this. We have um, a situation now where China has to try to save face. And, and, and for anyone who has not lived in that part of the world or in a country where saving face is important, we're going to find out just how important China really thinks this is today. Oh, and that's going to be the topic of our second half hour. That's right. And the yep. conversation piece for our, our uh, second hour as well. David Welch, you're up. Yeah, well, interesting story on, you know, we've seen oil prices coming down, right? We've seen, I think, gas prices declining here in our own neighborhoods, uh, trickling down. Well, you know, China is one of the largest consumers of oil in the world, along with the United States. And as anytime you've got an economic contraction, you usually have a decrease in oil consumption. People aren't driving as much. I know I'm not driving as much as I was previously. I don't want to keep filling my tank uh, with... <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> driving the glorified motorcycle. Are you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You cut your cylinders in half? Yes, Good. I did. <laughs> so um, what's interesting is there's a, a news service uh, in Beijing, um, Kai Chen, and they actually uh, had a study, a survey of economic activity. And what they found was actually very interesting. Manufacturing activity slowed considerably in July, and in fact, they think it may have actually contracted, which would mean they are also entering a recession as well. After the latest round of coronavirus lockdowns uh, ended in June, um, there was an exuberant surge in production, which wound up being an oversupply situation. So there just wasn't the demand because people didn't have the money, right? We've reported tanks to the banks last week where people are having a hard time getting a hold of their cash uh, to lubricate uh, the economy, and they're starting to really see the effects of this. Now, we're actually, this is for July, we're entering into August, and it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what that survey produces. Uh, what they also report is that retail is in the most trouble. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, so among, um, you know, that sector. So they're highlighting fears about the coronavirus lockdown. Again, people are getting conservative with their money, and so, you know, you're not going to go out and buy any consumer goods if you can't get if your cash. You've been starving for a couple of weeks, and you know, a couple of months ago, right? You're thinking about uh, different sets of priorities um, than perhaps we are even here in the U.S. Uh, just kind of uh, closing down with this, uh, the Chinese real estate market also slipped 33%. During the survey period, this was really this was after, after. the eighty nine percent collapse of the prior year. So this is a really astonishing one hundred thirty percent decline. Yeah, what well, was eighty nine, and then another yeah, thirty. That, so yeah, it was like, yeah. yeah, and not so, only that, but yeah. they're having a mortgage walkout. Too. That's right. People who are paying mortgages on housing that was never finished stop paying on those yeah, just mortgages walked away and wa are walking away it's a new form of laying down movement <laughs> it is isn't it we've talked about that yeah. michael it was very interesting how we've seen the videos of them blowing up the zombie buildings yeah. uh, yes. around china and you just think about the impact that has if you laid your hard money down on a structure and you're paying a mortgage and then they're going to blow it up Right. I wonder whose mortgage money that is being blown up. I'll bet our money, pension funds. I was going to say, it wouldn't be any BlackRock pension yeah, Black money, Rock would it? BlackRock wouldn't yeah. be in on that, would they? Yeah. No. You so, know, another thing, following up on what you said, David, today I saw where China shut down a city of 1.76 million people because they found one case yeah, of COVID. I saw that too. My goodness. So, one so, case. One case case in how many million people almost two million people. almost two million people they shut they shut the whole thing down what's the percentage of that it's like the worst percentage of all time well i hope they still feed the pandas at the local zoo well you know it's a real head scratcher this one this no covid policy uh where they shut down a city of 1.76 million because mm -hmm. one person has covid well but they can keep all those two million people from going to the bank see yeah and there you go, Billy. speaking of COVID, I'm picking up a story today out of National Pulse by Natalie Winter. This is just out uh, last week. 
Who and it's um, all about An- our friend Anthony Fauci and the National Institutes of Health still funding the uh, web- bioweapon research of China's Chinese military and CCP. Mm. Uh, it's kind of hard to figure out why, but that's the case. So the National Institutes of Health database shows two fundings this year. One was for transmission blocking vaccines, and this funding went to the China Medical University, which was formerly known as Peasants Red Army Military School. And that, of course, that school, of course, is a function of the CCP. Hmm. The second funding from Dr. Fauci and the National Institutes of Health went for a study of transmission of diseases throughout urban areas. Uh, and this was given to the China Southern Medical University, which was formerly known as First Medical, First Military Medical University, and that <laughs> is, <laughs> that university is controlled by the Military Committee of the People's Liberation Army, which of course is also controlled by the CCP. So. Um, where all of these programs that uh, China is operating also here in the United States fall under the CCP's 863 program. Now, have we ever talked about this program? I don't don't think think we have. Not on the program. I think this is something that we need to pick up here soon. The 863 program is the program by which the CCP sends out scientists and students and whatnot to various institutions like the National Institutes of Health to learn what's going on, who's got the secrets, and how do you get the secrets. So that's the uh, 863 campaign. But Hmm. the big question this raises for me and probably everybody in the civilized world is why is the United States of America giving the Chinese military and the CCP our money to study these diseases that are really causing havoc in the world. Question, Michael, is is there any uh, interest in Congress in investigating us, the current Congress? Oh, boy, is there ever, and guess who's doing it? Dr. Mm. Rand Paul Mm. has announced that he's getting set up should the Republicans win the uh, majority in the in the House and Senate. He's getting set up to investigate the gain-of-function research conducted by the National Institutes of Health and uh, Dr. Fauci and so on. Now, didn't uh, Dr. Fauci and the, uh, the, 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 the folks in different branches of our government be, get kind of clever around giving money to the CCP? I mean, oh, didn't yeah, they give it, was, it was really clever. So what, what, would ha- what I found out... I mean, he wasn't happened. writing checks to the, to the Chinese government. Yeah, they yeah. weren't just writing checks to the Chinese government. They're routing them through EcoHealth Alliance, mm. uh, whose principal, Peter Strzok, became famous for setting up a nonprofit organization to protect, uh, what are those funny critters that hang around the swamp down in Florida, those big, huge... Prehistoric alligators? Yeah, there's, what are, they're not alligators. They're a funny-looking critical yeah. critter that's almost like a big, fat seal. Oh, and oh, oh, you're talking manatees. about manatees. Manatees, manatees yeah. yes. So Peter Stock set up a, a nonprofit organization to protect manatees from boat propellers. But we quickly realized that the big money... Mm-hmm. is in drugs. So he switched the focus of EcoHealth Alliance to brokering money from uh, donors to uh, researchers. And mm-hmm. so when Barack Obama's pres- uh, administration terminated the gain-of-function research by Dr. Ralph Barrick at the University of North Carolina and said, you can't do that. Yeah, you know They were weaponizing... Yeah viruses. You can't do that. So Dr. Barrick shut down his uh, laboratory, but he gave the bugs to uh, Dr. Shi Jian Li, who took him to Wuhan Virology Institute. And so how do you get money to China? Well, mm-hmm. you give it to Peter Strzok at EcoHealth Alliance. Who uh, Michael, takes isn't it- that Peter Dazak? Dazak. Yes. Okay. Dazak. Thank Sorry. you for the correction. D-Z, I think. 
D S Z A K or something like that. One of those that. last names nobody can spell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does that. <laughs> Too many consonants. But at any rate, so he t he uh, took the money to Wuhan Virology Institute. Mm -hmm. Now it's really interesting that uh, when the National World Health Organization took a research team to the Wuhan Virology Institute to see what happened. And this is fairly recently, maybe uh, in the second year of the, of the uh, thing, everybody was pointing to the Wuhan. So they, t they took a research team there, and guess who was on it? Hmm. Peter Dazak. So it was like the, the, the blind, wolf. The blind leading the blind. Yeah, well, no, it was well, like the wolf it. investigating yeah. the ch what happened to right. the chickens in the chicken coop. Right? right, right. You know, and all of this winds up being perfectly legal, but still not right. Well, what are we doing? Yeah. Well, we know yeah. it. it's obvious now. If we, the more you look at it, you can, fig, you know, even even a blind cat can figure out where the rat is if the rat smells enough. Yeah. So well, if it, it, I think sorry, that uh, just a sec, John mm -hmm. T, I think that if Senator Rand Paul is able to, he will put all of this on the table. Otherwise, it's just you know us kooks here in Santa Cruz, California. Mm -hmm putting it on the table, and nobody's going to listen to us yet. But if Senator Rand Paul puts it on the table, uh, even the news media will pay attention, maybe. I've heard just, you know, we have our own influential circles of people, right? And people I know who are both liberal and conservative are really concerned about this whole process of how we might have exported this, you know, research off to what would be a competitor or, yeah. uh, you know, an adversary. Somebody who wants to kill us. <laughs> well, especially since it's been described as the coronavirus as being a weapon platform that you can put other, you know, pathogens on top of. It winds up being the carrier, um, which is really kind of icky it's that kind people of, would even it, think about wanting to In that regard, like it's this. kind of like a bomber. Yes, there is. So it's, yes, yes. Flying through the, the air with, with a, yes. a bomb bay full of bombs ready to drop on. Because one of the things Fauci said repeatedly is that the coronavirus is easily mutable. It's easily uh, configurable in a laboratory. And that's why they it, were experienced through having interest in looking at it. You know, I had a dream the other night, and it was a really unpleasant dream, I must tell you. And, and, it, and you know what this whole COVID-19 thing and the, 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 the information we're talking about right now, how it came up in my brain mm. during this... It remind, reminded me of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Very you much know. so. Let's go quickly to Jaunty, who has a comment, and then his news segment. Yeah, thank you, Michael. I just wanted to mention that we're, we're here in our conversation. We're looking at, um, I believe it's actually an area of Wuhan that's been uh, locked down again for one positive coronavirus case. And we're shaking our heads and we're thinking, you know, how, how at this point in time, this far along, or the, can they be this completely crazy, and yet at the same time, our own government is sending money to fund uh, research in, uh, <laughs> in the exact same place well, that this, uh, uh, this John, whole breakout originated. John, John T., what, what, what guarantee do we have that what broke out of Wuhan was actually COVID-19? I mean, uh, maybe well, that's what I mean, got them very excited about wanting to lock down you know, the area with only one proven case. I, just speculation. Well, I mean, yeah, sure. Uh, well, who knows? It's uh, um, it, it's uh, certainly an area in which we have uh, weaponized a, monkey a lot of yeah a, a lot of guessing going on, no doubt. Yeah. Um, so, it, so the uh, you know the, in terms of like having a big picture of what's happening in China, I, I found this uh, um, uh, this episode of uh, Serpent Za's uh, YouTube channel uh, quite interesting. Um, he lived in China for about eight years. He and his buddy Lowry, we also um, uh, uh, follow. Um, Lao Wai? Lao Rai, yeah, that's right. Uh, they, they both, uh, uh, I believe they both married Chinese ladies, and they're both back in the States. Um, uh, but they have, you know, connections there, obviously. Uh, so he's looking at this the, uh, sort of perspective of the common person in China. So you have the American dream, right? And that's to live a good life if you work hard, et cetera, et cetera. And that has all kinds of issues we're not going to discuss. But there's also a Chinese dream. Uh, and that's been uh, part of the economic revolution that they've been able to conduct over the past 20 years. Uh, and um, just recently in the last, well, I don't know, let's say seven years, that dream has really been impacted by a variety of things. You've got situations where 
billionaires like Jack Ma find themselves under house arrest and uh, having to renege on the ownership of their companies. So, you know, maybe you have some dreams about becoming a billionaire one day. Well, um, that might not be uh, something you can do unless you're, uh, 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 well, that really might not be something you can do at all anymore. That might be something that's just a thing of the past. That was an economic experiment. Um, it's, if you're a famous person, uh, like a tennis player or whatnot, well, you might just disappear if you do or say the wrong things. So don't feel like that's going to protect you. And then uh, there's uh, all of these issues happening to the sort of common person, um, wherein uh, you can't really rely on your investments anymore. I'll delve into that a little bit more. Um, uh, Serpent's DA mentions this concept of social harmony and how that's extremely important in the Chinese um, psyche. I think the United States is pretty robust in that regard. We're used to being d disharmonious or whatever it is. Um, uh, so we, we can kind of persist. But in China, you really want to see um, social harmony. You want to believe that you live in the best part of the world and, and you have um, a meaningful hope and uh, that you, you have, uh, you're going to be respected and taken care of by the government. Um, so, with, all, with regards to all these small regional banks in the Hunan province recently, who, um, they were popular throughout the country because they offered really good rates. So, people all over the country were going there to just get good interest rates. Uh, and uh, a, a variety of folks found that uh, what had actually happened with these banks is that bad actors within these banks had pinched the money, laundered it, you know, taken it overseas and bought real estate and whatnot. And so, the money was no longer in the banks. Uh, folks went to go and withdraw their savings online, and the website says, well, un, uh, un undergoing maintenance. Uh, and as that sort of <laughs> continued, uh, you know, they, it started to get folks really upset. So, you know, a whole bunch of folks decided, well, they're going to go to these banks and they're going to demonstrate. And then their, uh, their COVID health pass on their, on their phones turns red, you know, not allowing them to travel. Well, well, I mean, think about what that does to... Um, no big surprise there. We, we saw that coming. But um, think of what that does to the confidence in those health codes uh, within the society writ large to the extent to which uh, they're able to communicate what's actually happening to each other you know, within the censorship apparatus of the, the Chinese state. Uh, but regardless, about 1,000 to 1,500 protest, uh, protest, protesters still made it out to these banks. Um, they held up signs blaming the local government and not the national government, go figure. Um, and, and while they're all there demonstrating in front of these banks, these hired uh, like crime syndicate thugs show up en masse, totally coordinated, and just start beating everybody up. Um, so the, you, you believe in the government, you think the government's there to take care of you. It's, you know, we just need to get the government to notice what's happening to us and they'll step in and help. Well, no, they'll actually step in and beat the crap out of you is what they'll do. You know, John T., the most frightening thing you said there is that the dream is dead. And yeah. if you can't dream, what hope is there? And that uh, is a tough one. We're going to have to take sobering. a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go to uh, segment number two, War Drums. Satisfy your hunger with a fresh, prepared, twice-daily grab-and-go sushi you'll find waiting for you at Sushi Market Sprouts, two blocks from the beach at 300 7th Avenue in Santa Cruz. Fresh, delicious, and oh so good. Hello, I'm Junko, and I look forward to serving you at the Sushi Market Sprouts. Satisfy your hunger right now with the delicious ramen and sushi you'll find waiting for you at Kaito. Easy in and out location in the Capitola Mall food court. Special orders welcome. Fresh, delicious, and oh so good. This is Koji. I'm looking forward to seeing you at my restaurant, Kaito. We're headed for the warmest weather of the year. I'm Charles Friedman. Before you turn on that air conditioner up to max, give a thought to the safety of all the electrical circuits that keep you cool. Best way to check on the safety of your electrical circuits is with the help of Chris Jensen and the staff at JM Electric. Chris, what should we be watching out for? Thanks, Charles. It is really important to be mindful of the electrical circuits that power air conditioners. Any electrical leak from these circuits is a real fire danger. You may not be able to see the electricity leaking from the circuits behind your walls, but JM Electric's state-of-the-art testing equipment can find them. And JM Electric is happy to help folks out with a free home assessment to see if the current safe testing service is right for your home. Give us a call at 422-7819. Go straight to jmelectric.com and take the home electric safety test. After you answer 12 yes or no questions, you'll have a good idea about how safe to feel. 
If you don't feel safe, call JM Electric and ask for a free current safe home assessment. That's JM Electric at 422-7819. You'll sleep well at night. If you have a home, you have problems. But in your neighborhood, you've got an ace in the hole. Hello, Charlie Friedman here with good news for all of you out there who have a garage door that needs painting, a gate that needs a hinge, or a leaking seal on the shower faucet. The good news is you can find a solution for almost every home and garden problem at your neighborhood Ace Hardware store. That's right. You don't need to go to that big box store because you can find neighborhood Ace Hardware stores in Freedom, Marina, Gilroy, Salinas, and at two locations in Watsonville. These Ace Hardware stores are locally owned by my friends Manuel and Carlos Rodriguez. They're almost always on hand to make certain you find the solution to your problem. So, when you have a problem, head for your neighborhood Ace Hardware store. You'll be met at the door and taken straight to the solution to your problem, and you'll be on your way soon with the solution in the bag and a smile on your face. Now, at all Ace locations, pick up your Longevity Tangy Tangerine and Healthy Body Start Packs at great prices. Ace is the place. You're Ace in the Hole. Hey guys, it's Rob Carson on KSCO. Yeah, a special gift from me to you if you want to check out. We've made it a lot bigger. It's called the Rob Carson Show. We have a, a lot of stuff to get on the show, not only the great guests that we have, but also the great satire that you hear on the show. And we have seen uh, some good news and some bad news as far as the uh, country is concerned, as well as my commentary. So if you want to check that out, just go to KSCO. Don't miss the Rob Carson Show, 9 to noon, right here on KSCO. Ciao, I'm Luca from Tramonti at 528 Seabright Avenue, steps from the ocean. We are the authentic Italian pizza and pasta restaurant, serving also organic salad and house-made dessert in a friendly, family-style atmosphere on our lovely patio. We bake our bread and prep our fresh pasta and pizza daily. Allora, buon appetito! Visit Tramonti at 528 Seabright Avenue. That's Tramonti at 528 Seabright Avenue. Those drums, ladies and gentlemen, are Chinese war drums. And that is the subject of this segment of China Watch Radio. Nihama! Well, that means there's Michael Olson with Billy Graff, David Welch, John T. McCollier, and Susan Simon on the boards. So let's uh, run through the, sh the sh subjects of this half hour. Billy, what do you got going? Well, Taiwan, uh, as you know, has uh, been visited by one of our big leaders. One of our uh, main people in our government has gone there to, well, tell them we, we're, we, we're behind them. And guess what? Now the Chinese, the mainland Chinese military is conducting drills. There you go. Near Dave, Taiwan. David, what do you got? Well, the Chinese invasion of Taiwan may come sooner than expected, leading on the heels of uh, Billy's story. Good. And um, I've got uh, a, a piece here about how Xi Jinping orders Joe Biden to stop Pelosi. But <laughs> it didn't stop <laughs> Pelosi. It didn't work. Then no. what? John T. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I read a very piece of, uh, interesting piece of analysis with regards to what a war between the United States and China over Taiwan would actually look like the main thrust of which is to suggest that it might not be over in a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It might be something considerably longer than that and considerably higher risk than some sort of laugh it off, uh, you know, international incident. Yeah, Ooh. frightening Very. stuff. Well, okay, let's start it off, Bill Graff. All right, well, as we mentioned, Mrs. Pelosi has gone to uh, China and, uh, well, to, to, to the Republic, People's Republic to, to the uh, Republic of, of Taiwan. Yes, sir. She's gone there. And uh, her visit, of course, as we knew, anybody who's watched it closely, you know, China said that they would, uh, they, would, they would respond, and they have. And here's how they've responded. They're now conducting live fire drills uh, off the coast of Taiwan. <laughs> And uh, Beijing on Tuesday announced uh, that they would be doing these live fire drills in six maritime regions and in the airspace off the coast of Taiwan between Thursday and Sunday local time there. Now, this is, of course, right after Mrs. Pelosi uh, became the highest ranking U.S. official to visit the island in 25 years. 25 years. She departed Taiwan on Wednesday, 
the live fire exercises started today, hmm. Thursday. Uh, Taiwan's defense ministry called the move from China a threatening gesture. Duh. No kidding. <laughs> anyway, uh, the reckless behavior by the communist Chinese government of conducting live fire drills in waters and skies close to Taiwan, some of which were in the neighboring waters of Taiwan, threatens international aviation routes, challenges international order, damages the status quo in the Taiwan Strait, and destroys regional security says a spokesperson for Taiwan's defense ministry at a press conference last night. There you go. Now, uh, you know, this his statement pretty much lays out what everybody's worried about. But uh, I'm, I'm dying to hear what uh, Jonti has to say about uh, well, some of this. He's up last. Yeah. David Welch is up now. Well, we keep talking about the Chinese coming invasion of Taiwan, and the, the U.S. officials are saying, well, maybe sooner than expected. You know, I'm reminded a little bit about this. You know, here in California, we always talk about the big one coming, right? And it's yeah. like the odds, you know, it's been so long since we've had the big one, we've got to expect an earthquake, you know, any time now, maybe the next decade. And so I think it's really difficult to predict you know, some type of a timeline. But I do think it's interesting that a lot of uh, uh, analysts and insiders are, you know, starting to kind of turn up the heat a little bit of, ex you know, public expectation. And we can kind of maybe speculate as to why. Um, you know, it's interesting how the rhetoric uh, keeps upping the game as well. Like you were just reporting, uh, Billy, with uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit. And I'm glad that she actually went. I support, you know, her going, I think that that was, uh, you know, to back down in the face of that would have been, you know, just epically that's tragic. Our, that's our subject for our open talk, you know. We're going to have a great conversation about that subject, for sure. So what's interesting in this uh, Axios News article is that, uh, uh, you know, China is getting stronger, right? They're starting to demonstrate capability. Uh, Taiwan, which we've talked about before, is also bristling with defenses that we've sold them and European nations have sold them as well and trained. Uh, but they're saying they don't expect an imminent attack from China, but the speculation from various officials in Taipei and Washington is that maybe, you know, beyond the next 18 months. So I kind of find interesting is the timing where we're looking at the National Congress election in China coming up in November, like we've been reporting. We also, about that time frame, have a U.S. presidential election. And so you wonder if they were going to pull something, you know, first off, what would the right outcome of the Chinese election be, right? Would they have the support within the new government to do this. And then secondly, how would that coincide with, you know, our own election here? Um, you know, that would certainly drive a wave of nationalism in the United States, and they'd probably get a candidate that they probably wouldn't optimally like to have <laughs> for doing things like trade negotiations. So, and they're good at reading tea leaves, right? The Chinese are very good at, you know, the big Playing game and the big chess. chess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So we're going to continue to play uh, a game of speculation on what's next uh, for Taiwan. You know, one of the things that really struck me about that speculation mm -hmm. is that China's need to do something before its population collapses. Yeah, see, because they're on a timeline for that because their population is getting older. So I read a report not too long ago that s said that if they were going to attack and try to get Taiwan back in the fold, they should do it fairly quick because... Uh, before a couple they of, run out of people. Before they run out of young people to fight the war. Yeah. Know. Well, and Billy, on that, too, just in the closing point, um, you know, what China is, what experts in Washington are, are believing China is learning from uh, the, the Russia's fight with the Ukraine is, is what Colin Powell always told us. You have to go in with overwhelming force and a clear objective. And so, you know, if China does attack Taiwan, they're thinking they have to do it with overwhelming force which presents all kinds of interesting problems for them in terms of mounting an evasion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Amy Howe made an interesting comment uh, in saying, she said, they should have just kept cool because they could have got the, the vote. That's right. You know, they could have got the vote. But they started acting like idiots, and hubris. now nobody wants anything to do with them. No. Hubris and arrogance is always a downfall. Yeah. So, uh, with respect to that, now I have a, uh, a segment of, about uh, how Xi Jinping is trying to order Joe Biden to stop people from visiting Taiwan, specifically, of course, Nancy Pelosi. And this from Breitbart News. Well, don't they have to tell Obama first, and he'll tell Biden? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> so this from Breitbart News from Francis Martel of August 2nd, which is just a couple days ago. But um, what Francis Martel does is he picks up the communications from the uh, Chinese Foreign Ministry in response to Nancy Pelosi's visit. And needless to say, they were very disgruntled at the, at the temerity of, of that visit. And uh, the communication insisted that President Joe Biden has a responsibility to stop lawmakers from traveling to places Beijing disapproves of. This from <laughs> <laughs> boy, talk about a kid beating that the sand like in the something sandbox. Something out of a Sesame Street <laughs> skit. <laughs> I know. Well, you know, probably doesn't translate so well. But at any rate, yeah. uh, we all know that America does not recognize China or, t or Taiwan as a country, <laughs> thanks to the, our one China policy. So the Chinese Communist Party cons insists that all countries that seek diplomatic relations with it ignore the reality of Taiwan's existence as, an in, as a uh, part of China. Uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry described Pelosi's visit to the country as a, quote, serious violation of the One China principle. And the CCP claims that Taiwan is a province of China and that Pelosi's visit gravely undermines peace and stability. They say that uh, Pelosi was sending a seriously wrong signal to the separatist forces. Who would that be? The Nationalist Army, of course. The, of Taiwan. You know, of Taiwan, who does not consider themselves separatists. They think the CCP is the separatist. You right? know, Michael, we should do, and, and Billy and Johnny, we should do a show on the history of Taiwan. Because if you go back to the... Oh, six, it's fascinating. Yes, yeah, so if you go back to the 1600s, um, it was actually ruled by a series of Europeans, yep. and then the Japanese... And, then and up very, to 50 years ago, the Jap or up to World War II, the Japanese were in control, yeah, were in of, control Taiwan. of Taiwan. Yeah. Right. China had a very small period of time where they had a few boots on the ground uh, during one of the last dynasties, and that was it. Otherwise, it's almost like their claim on Tibet being Chinese soil, yeah. uh, that, that they actually own Taiwan. It's a stretch. Well, they're shortly going mm -hmm. to claim that they own the whole world is probably think, what they're going to claim. Yeah. But at any rate, going back to this communique, yeah. Uh, yeah. in the foreign ministry communique said, since Speaker Pelosi is the incumbent leader of the U.S. Congress, her visit to and activities in Taiwan in whatever form and for whatever reason is a major political provocation to upgrade U.S. official exchanges with Taiwan. And it is. And uh, it is. It is. I and mean, thank you first very much. Time in Mrs. How, Pelosi. In first time yeah. in how long? Yeah, exactly. So um, China absolutely does not accept this, and the Chinese people absolutely reject it. Which Chinese people? Yes. The ones yeah. in the, Taiwan kind of liked it. The CCP <laughs> <you> go, <laughs> uh, The foreign ministry went on to complain that President Joe Biden mm. should have intervened to ban Pelosi from traveling, a significant <laughs> misunderstanding of separation of powers because they actually don't think there yeah. is such so, a so thing they, here. They, they right? used to telling the women to stay home, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, what they don't understand is how the United States government works. <laughs> Obviously, they haven't studied basic American yeah. government. No. That's right. Yeah. Well, they, they're thinking as they think, you know. Exactly. There's one person in charge of everything, and everybody does what he or she says. Um, so they continue to say China is all along opposed to the visit to, uh, to Taiwan by U.S. congressional members. And the U.S. executive branch has the responsibility to stop <laughs> such visits. The foreign ministry also repeated the now common Chinese government refrain that anyone who supports Taiwan will die a gruesome death. These moves, like playing with fire, are extremely dangerous. Those who play with fire will perish by it, the foreign ministry says. Mm. Now, this follows up a, a conversation that Xi Jinping had earlier with uh, President Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. This is before uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. The two got together, and what did Xi Jinping tell Joe Biden? 
According to Chinese state media, Xi said, those who play with fire will perish by it. It is hoped that the U.S. will be clear-eyed about this. So, Xi Jinping told Joe Biden not to allow Nancy to visit. And, and remember, the topic of our program today is saving face, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so if you follow the logic of what you've just laid out, Xi Jinping told the American president, hey, get your ducks in a row. Don't, mm -hmm. don't violate our, our, our policy here uh, in China or bad things are going to happen. Whereupon Mrs. Pelosi lands in Taiwan, says hello, reaffirms, shakes everybody's hand, reaffirms our support of Taiwan, and leaves. Yep. So now, basically, I, I interpret that, and I'm just a lay guy, but I interpret that as a big old slap in the face. Well, well you know, whose also, face is being slapped? That's the segment that we're going to be picking yeah. up Xi next. Xi Jinping's yeah. face. Yeah. 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 Perhaps. You know, but I just think about this from the the point of view of the Taiwanese people, when you have the third highest ranking person in the United States government visiting, it says that we're serious. We're serious about partnering with them. We're serious about maintaining our trade relations with them. And we're serious about honoring our military commitments for selling of assets to them to defend themselves. I thought that would have to be kind of a buoying activity and maybe why the Chinese are so, uh, government is so concerned about her visiting. Well, that and the fact you have to remember when Go back to my original premise on just about everything in life. Yeah. When you want to know something about something, follow the money. Follow the yes, money. Right, yeah. Taiwan has a bunch of money invested in really high-quality computer chips. They do. A lots of money, and they make the best chips in the world. Everybody says so now. That's Everybody right. says so. Yeah. Right? I think Why? that has to be put in context. Go ahead and put it in context. John, to you up. Well, I mean, you mentioned, Billy, earlier in your segment um, that uh, Beijing has, has cut off Taiwan from the um, uh, import of, of uh, sand. Of sand. Correct. So we're not talking about Taiwan having some kind of problem getting their beaches to be nice and white. Uh, the issue there is that sand is used to produce silica, which is then used to High produce High silica sand, yeah. So... so uh, we have a situation, I mean, just, just to lay out recent history, P uh, Pelosi's husband sells $4 million worth of uh, NVIDIA stock at a loss. Poor guy, I would love to sell $4 million worth of NVIDIA stock at a loss. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, around about this time, the U.S. passes the CHIPS Act, which is a, um, a $280 billion investment in domestic uh, microchip manufacturing a huge portion of that is going into R&D. A whole bunch of it is incentives to, uh, uh, to build facilities um, you know, all throughout the United States. Some of them are really massive. A quick, and, and interjection, then, a quick interjection. Mm -hmm. Do you think the Chinese 863 project will be appreciative of all the money that we're spending <laughs> on research and development? <laughs> well, I mean, that's I'm an sorry. interesting segue ahead, somewhere Georgie. else. But I, I just want to <laughs> clarify my point before yeah. you guys get distracted. Um, that happens easily. <laughs> we, we now have Nancy Pelosi engaging in what is, regardless of you know, our opinions about it, very provocative behavior, which is changing the, uh, which has the potential to dramatically change the microchip industry's landscape. So Ooh. there can Explain. be a variety of winners and losers in this circumstance. Explain that comment, John. What do you mean by dramatically changing the landscape? Well, it looks to me that um, the manufacturing that's been going on in Taiwan is no longer worth the risk to, uh, to the United States, essentially, but to the West. And we're looking to move as much of that manufacturing to, uh, to the U.S. as we possibly can. Uh, a great way to accelerate that is to heighten tensions with Ch between China, China and Taiwan such that of uh, businesses worldwide say, well, I don't want to have a, 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 a contract with Taiwan because that's really flaky. Uh, uh, China's doing these blockades every time something untoward happens in their, in their relationship. So I'm going to go ahead and, and make my contract with a, a U.S. chip manufacturer instead. 
Uh, there could be very well be an economic aspect to this. Uh, well, which, uh, you know, that, that's what, with respect to what you said, Jeep hmm. said the same thing when it got the hell out, of, announced it was getting the hell out of, out of China. It said, I ain't going to hang around here and get between these two. Uh, it's, it's probably worth noting that the largest chip manufacturer in Taiwan is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, the TSMC. And they're actually, as part of this package, going to be building plants in the United States. And they actually have one of the smallest submicron chips uh, manufacturing capabilities in the world. And all the, the tools for manufacturing actually come from the United States. So there's companies like Applied Materials that actually build the technology that then these chip companies use and adapt to build these ever-increasingly smaller, lower-power components. And right now, TSMC is one of the king of the hills of this. And Intel happens to be a lagger, which is a challenge. But TSMC is coming to the United States, from what I understand. Yep. Right, yeah. big time. Uh, and, and so this, this visit in that context has a very different flavor. Is this China losing face because they can't stop Pelosi from visiting Taiwan? Or is this... Pelosi intentionally sabotaging the Taiwanese chip manufacturing business in order to boost the domestic USA chip manufacturing. Yeah, who is losing face? Ladies and gentlemen, that's mm -hmm. our subject for the whole second hour of this program, which you get to participate in by picking up your phone and call 831-479-1080, and Jaunty's going to finish up here. Okay, well, um, I do in six minutes. I don't know how much, I, how good of a job I can do of reviewing this. Uh, look, Hal Brands uh, of the American Enterprise Institute published a paper talking about what a war between the U.S. and China would actually look like. And um, there's a couple things to sort of realize with regards to that. Is that it? it, it you know, there's there's this tendency to look at the first 72 hours or the first two weeks of a conflict over Taiwan. Uh, that might be a little naive because it's going to be very difficult for either the United States or China to accept some sort of negotiated defeat in a short period of time. The, the Chinese government would be looking at the potential of collapsing if they, if they go two weeks and the U.S. destroys too many of their ships and they say, okay, fine, forget it, um, and, and the economic fallout as well. So China is probably stuck in it for a longer haul. Likewise, if the United States takes some meaningful losses, we're going to be in a position where uh, we're going to... Uh, our uh, national sentiment is probably going to demand that we remain in the conflict. Um, so the couple of things to sort of realize about contemporary warfare, uh, the, uh, the Battle of the Somme in the First World War, the Allies fired about, about close to two million shells in the week leading up to the battle. That's the artillery shells. Uh, right now, the Ukraine is firing about 500 shells per day. So the, the, the industrial scale of uh, contemporary warfare is um, uh, comically diminished compared to what's, what's possible in a fully mobilized situation. Uh, the, certainly artillery shells wouldn't be that relevant in this conflict, but the ability to produce um, various ships and various um, cruise missiles, particularly anti-ship cruise missiles, would be absolutely critical. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, we might not be gearing up for the right kind of conflict because we don't have massive stockpiles of the kinds of uh, a weapons that we actually would need. You know, John. Uh, so from a yeah, yeah, John. You know, we learned from the Operation Desert Storm uh, in '91 was that you fight wars, the modern wars, out of your inventory. I think that's what you're saying. R right, yeah. right, right. Exactly, and that inventory disappears really quickly. Uh, so that's one sort of tactical aspect to to acknowledge. Um, with regards to that endurance, China is uh, immediately able to produce more things like ships and um, they, they're able to retool their industry much more quickly than the U.S., but they're also looking at, at a, in a sort of a, a year-long conflict, a 20 to 35 drop in the gross domestic product from the United States being able to blockade them, uh, whereas the, the U.S., in the longer haul, in the sort of mid-range longer haul, is going to be in a much better situation than China. Uh, but something to really ask oneself is, how would such a war end? Uh, I mean, perhaps we should hold some of this over to the next segment, uh, but um, it's going to be very difficult for either the U.S. or China to accept any sort of defeat. Uh, and so then we, you have to sort of look at the, the question of, of uh, nuclear, the use of nuclear weapons. So the, the potential to have an accident when you're firing missiles, um, conventional missiles, into somebody else's country for them to think that it's a nuclear missile and retaliate 
is absolutely frightening, and it should it should ter terrify any rational person. But the other aspect of two countries going at it when they have nuclear arsenals is that they're going to be more comfortable expending their full conventional stock and supply and, and capacity, knowing that worst case scenario, they're not going to end up in a sort of a, a total war, or second world war style defeat because they can always fall back on on the nukes. They can always say, okay, okay, fine. You know, we'll, we'll accept defeat. Just don't, you know, or we'll nuke you. Um, we'll, let's negotiate or we'll, or, or we'll uh, escalate. Uh, so it creates, um, you see how it creates a sort of dynamic where you could screw up really bad and everyone can die, but also you can continue fighting at great cost to your own country and cost to the world um, because you're not, you're protected by that nuclear umbrella. Well, there's also a third outcome, too, which is you could have a political defeat, even though the armies may be, and the navies may be at some type of a stalemate. or Like Vietnam. Where they're like, yeah. Um, but, you know, you know, somebody like uh, Xi Jinping could be deposed um, if it doesn't or, go or taken out. Or taken out. If it, yeah. Exactly. Or Joe Biden could. It's same thing. Too, yeah. Yep. Wow. Well, that's a pretty frightening scenario, yeah, John T. What? As no I alluded, rainbows anywhere? As I alluded to, yeah. You did, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it yeah, when you write mean, all the time, Billy. <laughs> it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a very hopeful picture no. when the two of us go at each other. And, you know, with respect to um, the subject being Taiwan, I think Taiwan is just the first piece in the puzzle. Uh, yeah. Because if they get Taiwan... It ain't going to end there. No. Well, and, and look, the frightening thing about where Taiwan's located is it's very close to countries we, we really like now. Uh, Japan, South Vietnam. Korea, yeah. Vietnam. Uh, it's very close to some of our military assets, the island of Guam, the, island, the uh, Micronesian Philippines. islands. Yeah, Wake island. The Philippines, yeah. Wake Island. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 of course, as our guest last week said... Uh, this also affects other countries in the region, like Australia, New Zealand, yeah. and, you know, places like that. Everybody's so. sitting on pins and needles. Yeah, well, don't forget were. Japan, because if Japan relies uh, more on international trade than China does, yeah. and if Taiwan becomes part of the CCP's um, military extension, then uh, all the trade routes currently going to and from Japan are essentially cut. Japan's going to have to trade, yeah. uh, I, don't, I don't know, across the Aleutians or something. I mean, it really puts Japan in the uh, J place. J Japan, Japan, by the way, is the yeah. third largest uh, trading economy in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a minute left. Do you want to wrap us up, Billy? But hey, ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned for the next hour. It's your hour. It's open mic. We're going to ask the big question. Who is losing face and who is winning face with Pelosi? And ChinaWatchRadio.com, Beyond the Insider. Yeah. Go there. Go go to ChinaWatchRadio.com. Jonty's posted all of our articles we've been talking about and very much more, so please go there. A reminder, you're listening to AM 1080 KSCO Santa Cruz Salinas Monterey. Uh, news is next, and then we'll check in with Susan Simon for some traffic and, uh, and weather ahead of our second hour here on China Watch Radio. What's the phone number? Four seven nine one zero eight zero. Thank you. Five to nine miles per hour in the afternoon. Motors forecast for tonight: west winds five to ten knots, wind waves two to three feet. Swell southwest around two feet at fifteen seconds, and south up to two feet at ten seconds. Tomorrow, west winds 5 to 10 knots, wind waves around 2 feet, southwest swell around 2 feet at 14 seconds, and southwest up to 2 feet at 14 seconds. The time now, 6 minutes after 3 p.m., and that means it's time for the second hour of China Watch Radio. China Watch Radio is brought to you in part by Sushi Market Sprouts on 7th in Santa Cruz and Kaito in the Capitola Mall Food Court. Treat yourself to the finest Japanese cuisine you'll find anywhere with fresh sushi to go and delicious ramen dinners. Sushi Market Sprouts and Kaito. Yum! Nihama! Tongjaman! Woman Sai Nali Tingla. Yes, this is your hour for us to listen to you and to, to see how, uh, what you think of our 
our news that we presented all last hour. All kinds of different things happening. But, of course, the real big thing that's happened is that Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan. Big deal in many, many, many respects. Now, when she introduced the notion of going to Taiwan, everybody went into a huff. Oh, my goodness, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? Um, Then she wouldn't confirm the fact that she was going to to Taiwan. I don't think she ever did confirm the fact until she was there. And there she was. That's her style, though. She kind of leaves people guessing and speculating. And I think that's Billy, that's part of the drama we were talking about earlier. So we have a situation now where Nancy Pelosi, not the president of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. That's an important fact. The president of the United States was not in this particular piece of business. Yep. Nowhere to be seen. This was Nancy Pelosi. Now, remember, the president of the United States had just had a face-to-face visit Mm -hmm. with the leader of the CCP. And as we heard last hour, what what Xi Jinping, yeah, face-to-face via phone or perhaps Zoom meeting. Okay, but I mean, mean, it was a direct (laughs) conversation. Mm -hmm. And what what did Xi Jinping tell Joe Biden? You're playing with fire. Yes. You're going to get burned by fire. And here's what happened. And and The president said, well, okay, I hear what you're saying. And the next thing we know, third in command of the United States of America, the second heartbeat behind... Acting on her own. Acted, well, yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, maybe. So, I think we're going un- to try to unravel this with your help out there. And the question is, who is losing face uh-huh. and who is winning face? So, 831-479-1080, let us know. Who do you think is winning face in this dramatic, diplomatic... We, we would love to hear what, your what, what would you call it? A diplomatic invasion of yeah. Taiwan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it strikes right off the cuff, is, you know, who's winning on face for this has got to be the Taiwanese people and the Taiwan government to yeah. be reinforced like this by such a senior member of our political establishment. Mm-hmm. By the United visit. States government. Well, by the United States Care- government, you're right. Well, ca- careful, John though, King? careful, though, because what we've had is this, this uh, incident, and um, the, the uh, incident has instigated a response, and we have, not, we have yet to see the results of that response. Yes. Uh, it's a little, I think it's a little early to say, well, wow, Taiwan really won. No, wait. Um, all all, all you know, we can say is winning months. and losing. We're, we're talking about face. face. Let, me, yeah, let, face me re- a, let me respond to Jaunty. We have already had a response from the CCP. They are conducting live fire with real ammo. But we don't know if this is the end of it. What's jo- what Jaunty is no, saying, no. that this could go on, and we don't really know what right. the well, end John- result John- of this Jaunty's is. Jaunty is correct. But, yeah. but we do know the immediate response is they decided to, sh- to put up a show of force. Mm-hmm. So we know that, that they haven't given up their point of view. Mm-hmm. But you want to talk two about years- face? The- oh, okay, sorry, Jaunty. I, don't I was going to say two years from now, it could very well be that the, Ty- the, imp- the then impoverished Taiwanese people We'll look back to that time when that villain Lance, Nancy Pelosi visited, and that was the beginning of the end of our of our uh, ability to sustain our economy. See, I, I, I don't think I, I understand what you're saying, and it's a that's a cogent point of view. I disagree. I just I, I believe you know we have never we've never been, we've always at our best when we put our our foot forward like this, right? In in, in sense of, of, yeah, of yeah. good and our values and no our hiding principles. hiding behind the bushes. No, um, it's when we hide that things, I think, go awry. Um, we're talking about saving face. And I spent a lot of years in Asia, as you guys know. And in terms of saving face, I would look at these live fire exercises as the CCP saving face with their own people yep. that they couldn't yep. present her from, from visiting. Yep. It, it looks to me like a spoiled brat kicking dirt. I, I know. Know. It's a comment made earlier about uh, you know the kid in the sandbox throwing the sand in the truck because he's yeah. unhappy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So who do you think is how? We'll put it this way: Who do you think is winning face, and who do you think is losing face? And that way we'll we'll put it in the present and see who's doing best as we go along. So Billy, let's pick up some phone calls. Eight three one four seven nineteen eighty. Love to hear what you have to say 
about what transpired between the United States and China this past week. Absolutely. All right, let's go first to Santa Cruz. Talk to Mary. She called in first uh, as we uh, began our second hour. Mary, you're on uh, China Watch Radio. Uh, wait a minute. You're on China Watch Radio if I push the button. There we go. <laughs> hey, Hi, man. gentlemen. Love the show. It's such a good one. Again, again, again. So Pelosi's running for president. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Boy, there's a. <laughs> that's a, I. I don't. Eighty one. Oh. What would she be? Eighty three years. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Mary, would you say that Pelosi's is w winning the face here? <laughs> Do you think she Absolutely. she's won the most face in this incident? Absolutely. Absolutely. She's won one hundred and ninety nine percent, and China is lost. The U.S. president is lost. We the people probably have lost too. Has, has Taiwan gained anything though? Um, yeah, uh, Pelosi will give them something. I don't know though. I think I think she's an Indian giver, and I don't mean that from. Ooh. <laughs> I haven't heard that in a long time. <laughs> Ooh. Um, yeah. Um, well. I, I would agree with you. I do think that Nancy Pelosi is the big winner um, in this in this uh, diplomatic well, if I could, I issue think, here. I think she's, she's the big winner in the USA domestic circles. I, I still think the preemptive winner, though, is still Taiwan and the Taiwanese people with the prestige that was granted by her visiting. Right. Jaunty, what do you, Jaunty, what do you think? Do you, th do you think uh, Nancy Pelosi is running for president? Uh, no, I, I think she already is. I don't think she actually is. <laughs> I mean, why would she bother with that? It's just an expensive campaign, and she's already kind of running the whole show. Certainly, the Dems have been have recovered uh, of late in the in um, in the polls. Uh, so there's there's that aspect as well, playing to the domestic audience. But I also think that there's a variety of winners who are probably. Uh, Nancy Pelosi's friends and family who have been engaged in a variety of, of uh, insider trading. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Mary? So here's, the thing. here's the thing. Obama has his cell phone and pen in her ear. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's what we were saying earlier, Mary. We were envisioning that you know, um, the Chinese are telling Biden to tell her not to come, and they should have just told Obama to tell her not to come. Tell Biden to tell Obama. <laughs> that's like yeah. a daisy chain pass on telephone. Yeah. 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 None of this is an accident. And frankly, I think the most important thing is we supposedly have an al-Qaeda um, death in the current administration. I don't think it happened. Well, they, 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 you know, they took... They used an unbelievably expensive missile to kill a 71-year-old guy that with asthma. With asthma that we had kept imprisoned for a long time. I'm just not sure what the total threat there was. Uh, well, that, that's reminiscent of who was it? I think it was uh, Bill Clinton that uh, shot a missile into an asp or to a milk factory, a milk formula factory, or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Maybe it was an aspirin factory or something. Yeah. So, but when you have when you have a missile, you can shoot it, I guess. Yeah. What's that, Mary? Yeah. So here's the thing. Um, everything, our solar panels, our windmills, you know, everything is made in China. Still today, we have not ramped up anything in this country. So why is that? I mean, I'll tell you why. It is because. There are people in the White House and throughout the administration that are heavily invested and paid hugely millions and probably billions of dollars collectively to not have these things made in the U.S. How stupid. Well, you know, Mary, it's interesting. I've got friends of mine who manage supply chains, and what they'll tell you is that it's incredibly difficult to build something in the United States because all of a fantastic number of small pieces of material that you need to put things together just aren't made here anymore. You need a washer, 
Um, you need to make screws. You need to make, you know, all kinds of, of just components that would go into something. And, and it's just like, not Mar here. like uh, Mary says, all of those things have been offshored. They've all been offshored. Yeah, everything so you can do on. some final assembly here. Let's, uh, listen, do you know how much coal it takes to make a solar panel? Do you have any idea? Yeah. Nobody's telling us. It's not on the front line of any communications, but it's huge. Yeah. And if you're talking about fossil fuel not being used to do this so-called Green Deal, you're an idiot. You're a complete idiot. Well, there's that's a lot of that's, here. that's something I can... Dante? Those, those products from China are net zero on fossil fuel, period. And nobody's talking about it, but that's what it is. Okay, Mary, thank you so much for the call. You're, you're, you're uh, breaking uh, the actually, fever dream, Mary. Yeah, you kind of uh, <laughs> laid, it, laid it on the table when you said that Nancy Pelosi is running for president, and Jaunty said, no, she is the president. Yeah. So we're off to a roaring start, I guess. <laughs> Thanks, I just want to mention quickly, guys, I um, spent a couple years uh, back when I was uh, young and strong and beautiful in installing uh, solar electric <laughs> systems. And um, what we said back then, uh, early 2000s, was that um, a, uh, a significant, usual sized uh, mm -hmm. solar electric installation would take about four years to offset the greenhouse gases that were uh, expended in order to produce it. So that's it. give or take four years. Life of the system is 20, 30, 40 years. But the first four years, uh, in terms of the environment, you're just paying it back. Okay. All right. <laughs> Who do, what do we have up? Batter up. Okay, Dick in Santa Cruz, you're up next on China Watch Radio. Hey, oh, yeah. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I, I think a more relevant question is who is the loser in this? Well, that's, part of, that's part of the question. Yeah, who is the loser? Who's, the win, who's winning and who's losing? <laughs> that's what I care about. Who gets you know, the short I end mean, of the stick? Yeah. Okay, listen. This is all planned, just like the Wuhan lab and coronavirus. Mm. The Dems are working very closely with China. They got rid of Trump before. They, this is just this is the next move in the in the three D chess uh, that Mike likes to talk about. The three G chess is uh, Biden has, uh, of course, the Biden family is deeply entrenched in China, and that's why he's in their White House now, at least uh, physically. I don't know about mentally, but. Uh, He's going along with this, and uh, it was all planned out um, between she and him. I mean, they had a well, two-hour... Dick, just a minute, a just a minute. Talk, right? Let me, let me jump in really quickly. What do you think oh, Xi Jinping said going. when what? he told Biden, no, don't do no, it? No, no, we don't know what he said. We don't have the transcript. The, yeah. That's the problem. See, they, they demand the media and everybody screams for the Trump transcript, but we don't get the China transcript with Biden, do we? <laughs> Well, that's so a good point. Can we pause there for a second? Because you just made a powerful point. You know, we had with that kerfuffle with the, you know with the we related to the impeachment of first speech of Trump around uh, uh, Ukraine, right? And this meeting he had with uh, Zelensky, yes. and you know they got the transcript out. They had people who were invested in the phone call because there's like 20 people yes. eavesdropping on these phone calls, and they testified to verify the transcript was accurate and real. And at Dick's point. Uh, we have some critical communications with China that have occurred, and people have been yelling for the transcripts. Well, the only thing we know is nothing. what the Chinese <laughs> press said. Ooh. Yeah, was said. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, it's it's. This is all planned out. Nancy, you know, she knew she wasn't going to get shot down. You think she, you know, risked that? <laughs> she knew she wasn't going to shot down. Now the next play is like, you know, Biden's going to back up, and China, you know, of course. They wanted to show more power. They're they're getting closer and closer to to their invasion, and uh, this is all in their plan. And so everybody's everybody says there's no face to be saved here. <laughs> and you know the Bidens, uh, I mean the White House and the Dems are closer to the midterm, so it, it, this all looks good. But um, you know the losers. Who are the losers? <laughs> I would say the U.S. people, one, one reason is that 80% of the chips come from Taiwan, and when China gets in there, they're going to embed their little sniffer software. And uh, before you know it, they're going to know everything uh, the whole Western world is doing and controlling the last bit they don't already control. This is, we're at a boiling point, totally boiling point. Uh, I, you know, I don't know anybody in Congress that is like, 
talking about this. Uh, you know, I, he, he, and the other thing is, um, are you guys still there? Yes. Yes. Yeah. The, the one last thing I would say is that Biden is going to throw his support for China first. Yes. Not Taiwan first. Not, it won't be in the end when the, when the rubber hits the road, Biden will go, well, it's one China, right? D- you know? Dick, I hope you're We're wrong. Gonna... I, hope, I hope you're wrong, Dick. What, you want World War Three instead? No, I just know, but I hope, hope that there isn't some collusion uh, going on, you know, behind <laughs> the scenes that we don't know you about. You can hope all you want. I want yeah. the facts, you know. Yeah. I, I can't see it any other way. Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Where are you going to get facts? Yeah. Well, that's right. I want the transcript. You're not going to get any transcript. <laughs> you know, the only transcript you're going to get is that provided by the Chinese press. Yeah. And and according to the Chinese press, Xi Jinping told Joe Biden, "Don't do it." Well, this, is where, this is where true journalists step up, right? And they'll and they'll say, "Wait a minute, how do we know this wasn't? Uh, is this we, a right wing conspiracy?" Oh, wait, it really happened? You know, anything that people on the right start putting the dots together, like you guys do, and a few other people out there do, as far as I can tell, yeah. that they just go, right-wing conspiracy, and they don't show you a thing, they won't do a thing, the media drops the ball, everybody's afraid to say anything, you know, period, it's, it's dead. So, it, you know, we're really, you guys are the last frontier, like one of the last frontiers. I, don't, I mean, there's uh, Epcot Times, they talk about this stuff. Anyway, anyway uh, I'll... Well, I'll Dick, update, you I'm... certainly are a downer oh, yeah. today. Thanks for the call. We appreciate <laughs> but, it. We well, love your call you anyway. Very, thank you very much. Thanks, Dick. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Who's next? Uh, that would be Bill in Salinas. Uh, let's see here. Bill, you're on uh, China Watch Radio. Welcome, Bill. Yes. Yeah, hi. I would just like to mention something that you guys didn't talk about in your first hour when you were talking about the potential and maybe probable invasion of Taiwan. I think it's far more probable it'll be a, uh, a naval blockade, an embargo, quarantine, whatever you call it, but just shut off trade in and out of Taiwan. Mm-hmm. So we- if, you look at the, if you look at what's going on now with these uh, exercises they're doing, they look at the map, it's, it's, they've just circled around Taiwan, sure. and to show they can do it, it's like a... Uh, your world, this is what we can do, and don't uh, try to continue any trade. I, I expect that they'll probably announce a blockade in the not too distant future, and uh, it, it'd be effective. It's going to work. Uh, Bill, it, that was a matter of how. Yeah, we were ahead. we were speculating on that uh, about three or four weeks ago on the program that the initial military encounter would be a blockade. It wouldn't be a missile attack because they want to. They want the island. They don't want just a, a, a dirty rock. They would like to have a smoldering rock. They would like to have the infrastructure. So then the next move is, who, if they do that, whose move is next? That's our uh, move. Our move. Can, can, I, can I just bring something you, up here? Yeah. Uh, you know, we blockaded Cuba, and uh, I know people from this radio station who took three or four vacations to Cuba. It didn't stop anything. Yeah. They, they got food, they got water, they got hotels. Everything's well, fine. Well, we blockaded it's the missiles. It's 90 miles from yeah. the United States. Well, we, the people were doing... The blockade it was... Yeah, as Olson says, uh, we blockaded the, the actual missiles from arriving in Cuba. Yeah, yeah it was, that's right. Yeah, yeah and I'm, also, I'm so, so, well, also too, as soon as the military is involved in any kind of a blockade, all the insurance of Lloyd's of London goes away on merchant ships. So all of the container vessels stop sailing. Right, that's all you need to do. Uh, they're not going to run the blockades, and even in Cuba with the missile crisis, you know, we didn't have people running the blockades. Although, for a long, for years though, people have been still vacationing. There's been an embargo on Cuba after the blockade, and people would fly through Mexico to get to Cuba to go that's on vacation. That's my point. Yeah, they're not going to. They're not going to stop airplanes from landing in Taipei. But the blockade. Well, I- the blockade of Cuba, right. though, was a short period of time. It wasn't. We've had an embargo on them for decades, but the blockade was. So if China surrounds, I'd really if, like to hear our caller. He, yeah. he keeps getting interrupted. Yeah. Sorry, Bill, Excuse me, but there's yeah. two airlines have already canceled flights into tai- Taiwan uh, while these exercises are going on because they don't want to uh, stop from South Korea and one other airline have canceled. If, mm-hmm. if China tells the airlines, you know, stay out of this. This is a, uh, uh, a you know high risk. You may get shot mm-hmm. down. They're not going to risk that. Uh, nobody is. And the U.S. Navy cannot um, prevent it happening. I mean, that's a fact of life. Um, and I'm a retired Navy captain. Mm-hmm. so yeah. the, uh, Well, that, that's why I was going to ask you, do you think 
a a follow up move by the United States Navy would be to blockade uh, Chinese ports. I don't think we could do it. Well, it we, we don't have to do it. Don't have blockade the Strait of Macala. It's over. There you go. We don't. We don't. We don't have the power uh, to to uh, take on China over there. China's forces are 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 designed for their for along their coastline. They've got mm-hmm. thousands of missiles, uh, uh, shortest sea missiles. They've got uh, almost a thousand combat aircraft. Uh, they've got you know submarines. All these things are for their theater over there, not over here. There, mm-hmm. and we can only extend power. One of our aircraft carriers might carry seventy-five combat aircraft. Yeah. Okay, so it's just it's just it's just, it's just silly. We we would just have to take and wring our hands and and lament what's going on. But if, if China, yeah, but says Bill, we, there's a we don't need to we don't need to engage them in, near shore in the South China Sea. We can just blockade ships coming through the Indian Ocean. That's all we need to do. Well, and the I've U.S. Got, can I've easily do guys, that. Didn't you guys a little a few minutes ago? T- Talk about how dependent we are on importing things from China. Of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. cutting off our own nose oh, despite our face, right? We're not That's dependent. Right. We're not nearly as dependent as it's made out to be. I think our total imports is something like 7% of our GDP. But China is about 35% of their GDP. Well, it sounds to me like you're suggesting we've already lost. I, yeah, it's just a matter of time. And, and when China is ready, they'll do it. And I think this, uh, these exercises are to demonstrate to the public in the world, hey, we got this power where we can take and control the sea lanes around Taiwan. Um, if they have to, they could just take out the uh, Taiwanese um, container ports. There's only five of them. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, they're not going to take and blow up the island and kill a bunch of people, but I do think they're going to take over Taiwan, and it's just not very distant future. Well, Bill, your military background is compelling. I remember you've called a couple of times, and, and I appreciate your, your professional Navy experience. And thank you for your service. Exactly. Okay, guys. So interesting subject. Yeah, call us again, Bill. I'd love to hear from you. Okay. Wow. Here we are at the break, know. Billy Boy. Yeah, we are at the break. Uh, 479-1080 is the number to call. We'll take your calls uh, when we come back from... Somebody say something nice and happy. I, well, I, I kind of disagree with Bill, actually. So, yeah. mm-hmm. Satisfy your hunger with a fresh, prepared, twice-daily grab-and-go sushi you'll find waiting for you at Sushi Market Sprouts, two blocks from the beach at 300 7th Avenue in Santa Cruz. Fresh, delicious, and oh so good. Hello, I'm Junko, and I look forward to serving you at the Sushi Market Sprouts. Hi, I'm Sam Quinn for Coast Paper and Supply. Founded over 60 years ago, Coast Paper and Supply continues to be the one-stop local supply source for businesses, large and small, school districts, special events, and for your home. Their 1,800-square-foot showroom is huge, and it's packed with everything from paper and janitorial supplies to whatever you need for shipping and packing, no matter if you're moving your business or your home across town. They've even got motel-hotel amenities, disposable food service items, and even eco-friendly cleaning supplies. Discover for yourself why many local businesses, schools, and people go to Coast Paper and Supply for selection, low prices, and great customer service. You can find Coast Paper and Supply at 151 Josephine Street, open 8 to 430 weekdays. You can shop online at CoastPaperSupplyInc.com or give them a call at 831-423-3350. Primo Roofing is your full-service roofing company. They not only replace roofs, but maintain and preserve aging roofs with an entire division dedicated to postponing costly roof replacement. Their maintenance division specializes in pressure washing, coating and sealing, mold and mildew removal, gutter cleaning and replacement, preventative maintenance and repairs. Maintenance is key to long roof life. Are you ready to protect your roof? Call Primo Roofing today, working to extend and preserve the life of your roof. Do you ever wonder if you can know the truth? Jesus said you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. So dwell on truth with us. Sunday at 11 a.m. I'm Daniel Bodwin. And I'm Brenton Powers. We're Christians and missionaries. And we'll be answering your commonly asked questions from the Bible about God and humanity and salvation. So join us for the Dwell on Truth show every Sunday from 11 a.m. to noon here on KSCO. 
Hi, this is Dr. Duncan McCollum inviting you to join me 1 o'clock Saturday for McCollum Wellness Radio. I'll be discussing some of the latest trends in building your immune system. It used to be survival of the fittest. Now it's survival of the healthiest with the strongest immune system. Tune in so I can walk you through some of the best things that you can do to boost your immune system, reduce brain fog, increase your energy, and have an amazing life. Tune in this Saturday, 1 o'clock on KSCO for McCollum Wellness Radio. It's Michael Harrison inviting you to join me Fridays at 6 p.m. as we delve into the hottest news stories of the week on the Michael Harrison Wrap, right here on KSEO News Talk 1080 AM, 95.7 FM, 104.1 FM, and 107.9 FM. What do you say we kick off the weekend together, you, me, and the Michael Harrison Wrap, Friday evenings at 6, and start your days off right with Rosemary Chalmers weekdays from 6 to 9 a.m. right here on KSEO News Talk 1080. Tingla, tingla, we're listening to what you have to say, so pick up your phone and call us, 831-479-1080. This is China Watch Radio. We're talking about who won or who is winning face and who is losing face. A lot of interesting comments, my goodness sakes, and it's a lot of scary comments, too. <laughs> yeah, you... I was going to say that. <laughs> wow, kind of shaking in your boots stuff. Um, what do you think? Do you think that the United States won face by Nancy Pelosi going to Taiwan? Uh, do you think Taiwan won face? Do you think Xi Jinping lost face? Because he told Joe Biden, our president of the United States, don't do it. Don't do it. If you do it, See, I you're think all three of your questions are answered by a yes. I, th I think Taiwan won some face. I think Nancy Pelosi won some face. The people of, of Taiwan came out ahead, and I think Xi Jinping, at least in the first what round, got think, slapped. What do you think the people of China thought about this? Do you think, like Jaunty says, that uh, See, a, lot of, not... a lot of this shooting, shooting up that's going on right now by the C CCP's armed forces is to mollify the, the, the population? Well, look, I, I, because I'm not Chinese and never grew up in, in, in that... Uh, that's funny. You don't look like one either, fra really. frame of mind, I, you know, I don't know what the Chinese people think of their leader. I suspect the ones who got locked up in Shanghai probably don't think too highly of him. The ones who lost their, you know, the dog was killed on, on TV. I, I don't, you, you know, I don't think those people did very well uh, well, in, in his uh, lot in lot time defending I, him. Yeah, a lot of time I spent there with friends and coworkers uh, just hanging around in the evening and going on walks and just doing social activities. I'd bring up the government. I'm just kind of curious what people would say. And they're quick to kind of tai chi away, uh, you know, to, the topic. And, and people just don't really talk about it. They really Because they focus. think, you know, they're, they're hoping you don't have a listening device on, you know, built into your collar. Yeah. And these are people I knew really well, and they'd even been to my home. And they'll talk a little more freely when they're here, but still they don't want to. It's interesting how um, the government is almost a taboo topic. Um, you know, people you know they their probably daily lives. have to be that way to, uh, to survive. Well, I think many just don't approve. They don't like it, but you kind of knuckle down and you survive. You, you're in, yeah. It's like a survival mode yeah. uh, that I thought that a lot of these folks were in. Yeah. If, if you were to stand up and say, oh, I think this government sucks, yeah. they come come for you the next morning. One, one, thing, they were, away. one thing they were absolutely uh, staggered is I'd, um, a couple people, I showed them the Bill of Rights in the United States, and they thought this freedom of speech, and then the Second Amendment, and then like the Fourth Amendment on assembly, and so they was like, they were all like, "Holy cow!" And I said, "Yeah, that's the law of our country. That's our, that's the backbone of who we are." And hmm, that doesn't that seems a little odd to me because I picked up a copy of the uh, the Chinese Constitution when I was there in yeah. '98 and read it, and it had freedom of speech and all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, but it's not uh, real. It's, well, yeah, of course, but it's uh, I mean, it is written into their into their constitution and. Uh, um, but by the way, it's not always real here either. But um, the uh, do they have the I mean, Second Amendment? 
Uh, no, but... but um, a freedom but of assembly I, I and religion? That, I think that the general sort of illusion that, that persists in China is that uh, the government really is a beneficent organization that's trying to benefit the majority of the people. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's an extent to which there's some truth to that. Uh, they are trying to create stability and they are trying to uh, spur the economy and things of that nature. Uh, and people have seen a dramatic increase, by and large, in their standard of living over the last um, 30 years or so. And there haven't been any major massacres since, uh, since the 70s or so, with the exception of Tiananmen Square, I suppose. And, and the uh, Uyghurs. Yeah. Oh, and a few isolated. Well, certainly, certainly. But that's um, uh, in, in, in terms of the that's that's a very small portion of the population. There are, you know, the the eastern uh, Mongolians that. Uh, yeah, the yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. As the long Tibetans, as they're killing yeah. them and not me, it's fine. Ouch. Did you really just say that? Ouch. Yeah. Well, you know, that would be the way they would think. As long as, long as you're killing Uyghurs, that's fine. They're not killing me. So what's wrong with that? With a historical perspective on human nature, I'm not sure that that's an outlier. Uh, I think that folks in the United States were quite happy to see our government killing Iraqis and not worry too much about it. So, yeah. um, you know, that's sure that's the case there. Um, mm -hmm. But more to the point, I think people actually believe that the government is trying to provide free speech. Of course, the subtlety there is in our constitution. Yeah, I just that, that's we all. A, I'm sorry, ma'am. That's just hogwash. A, I mean, we just <laughs> we had films of like the drones flying around and the lockdown in Shanghai, telling them you know not, stop shrieking yeah. and screaming and paying off the balconies. Like, people know that things are locked down there, um, and the, the idea that that we somehow have some pseudo free speech here is nuts. I mean, we can get on this microphone and there say we anything are. we want about the government, and I'm not worried about people showing up tonight at my house. And yeah. in China, that's a completely different story. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure that that's the current uh, mindset with an awful lot of folks who have found themselves ostracized for a variety of opinion, opinions over the last couple of years. I, I think well, that, that's a lot of uh, the cancel culture, right? That's not the government um, actually coming and putting the clamps on people. But it's close. Cancel culture is close. It is. It's certainly headed that way. Yeah. Uh, well, if the government has a sweetheart situation with a variety of tech companies and a variety of tech companies can decide who does and doesn't uh, have a voice on their platforms and can or can't make a living, then um, it's getting pretty close to the government. That's, uh, well, then you've got a point there. I, you're, you're absolutely right there. W you know, where there's opportunities of government to pull a lever of power to have somebody else implement. Yeah. Uh, it's true. So who, the question is, who pulled the lever of power to get rid of Trump? Ooh, that's a big topic. That'll light up the board. I guess we better do something else. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, I do want to just finish that by saying that the the primary difference is that there they rely on the government to grant them things like freedom of speech and whatnot, whereas here we have a, whether or not people really understand the civics, <laughs> whether or not they're well versed in the in the documents or not. We have a sort of innate cultural understanding that those things come from a source above the government. Uh, that we don't rely on the government to grant them. If the government tries to take them away, then the government's doing something innately bad. Can, can I also make, make, make mention, you've you mentioned the Chinese constitution a number of times on this program. Uh, the, the, uh, I understand it exists. I understand you've seen a copy of it and, and read it, and it has many of the same statements in it that we have. But uh, my, my question is this. Most Americans are aware of the United States Constitution. Most people around the world are aware of the United States Constitution. Yes. I would venture to say the vast population of China probably doesn't know they even have a constitution. There you go, Billy. Well, I, bet, I, I would bet actually, they do. I, I would look at the scenario that I described earlier when we were talking about those folks protesting not being able to withdraw their money from the banks. Um, so you've got about 1,500 people protesting. They're all holding up signs that say, hey, a big CCP government, the, locals in this, the local government in this area has wronged us. Please come out and save us. And what, and what happened was they were attacked not by the police, but by a huge force of hired thugs. So it wasn't the government that came. I think that was a very strategic move, right? So it's, uh, it's a way of uh, the, uh, um, the central government insulating itself from any culpability uh, where, in fact, you know, for we would look at it, we say, well, obviously the central government is the problem here. But the fact that these folks actually are begging the central government to come and rescue them 
indicates that there's some faith in that central government, that they do believe that that central sure. government has their best interests in mind. Sure. No, I, yeah, I, you know, and, I, I and hear you that. know, I heard uh, Xi Jinping give a speech, and it was translated, of course, because I'm not that good with uh, Chinese. But what he was saying was that China is free. <laughs> we have free speech here. We have freedom of religion. You can say what you want. No, you can't, and no, you don't. You can say any loving thing you want but, about the but emperor. But he, he was pointing a picture as if uh, China was the United States. And if you disagree, look me up. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a conversation. Uh, right. Yeah. All right, let's uh, check in with Pure Heart. You're on uh, China Watch Radio. Hey, Pure Heart. Hi, good evening, afternoon, gentlemen. Before I get to my question, the free speech uh, sparked a comment. My, my friend sent me a link now to a, a retired military officer in England who just got arrested. Arrested, mind you, for then retweeting something which caused someone anxiety. Mm. He got arrested for causing someone anxiety. Well, now we're down to the cancel culture, well, aren't we? Yeah. And it's in the similarities of cancel culture uh, with the CCP. Well, if I could just share on this, I, I saw that report too, and it was very disturbing. Our guest last week, the banker from Australia, um, also shared that you know Australia is a Commonwealth, a common law country. Uh, much like the UK, they don't really have a constitution like ours with a Bill of Rights in it. Um, so they're, they have the ability to you know, lock down their press and to arrest people because somebody said something that made somebody feel bad. Well, they've been vandalized and treating their people like toddlers now, and it's, they're certainly trying here with the so-called cancel culture and what you can say. Yes. But on, on to my question, Mrs. Pelosi's visit to, to Taiwan I would think, don't you think that things with such moments are discussed behind the scenes between the big powers way before they actually come out for public consumption and they kind of, with the degree of, of magnitude involved with that risk, that they kind of mm. all gone on, this yes. is all kind of, whatever we actually get to see in real life is kind of theater. Yes. Right. Yes, yes and no. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Okay, I'll, I'll hang up and listen. Well, wait a minute. Oh, okay. What do you think? Um... Well, I'm wondering if this is going to be a way for them to excuse for China to gear up to cancel President Biden's re-election, you know, to work against him because he, you know, calls us lose Ooh, base. Oh, that's an interesting perspective. Is one thing, and we're going to have some cyber slapping going on behind the scenes, if not, mm. if not prearranged. So now we need to have a. Here's our excuse for the cyber slapping happening, so we can tighten our screws over here anyway. S but it's, you know, will it be in a, it's, it's, you know, when you go down this rabbit hole, it's just hard to know what to yeah. believe anymore. Yeah. So are you, are you suggesting that China will do to Biden what it did to, to Trump? Is that what I hear? If the, if the public occurrence is to be believed, that would be certainly be a great excuse. I heard a, <laughs> I heard a great theory that someone said, well, they could, they could, uh, but like the World Economic Forum and other rich people could hire Kami Harris away from the vice presidency saying, we need you more. <laughs> and she would say, yes, I want to serve my people, but I'm needed more here. Whereupon someone like, let's say, Gavin Newsom might be appointed vice president just to fill the, the hole. Like, And then after Biden mysteriously says, my dementia is worse than I thought, and he hires <laughs> And the, the guy who had said this pointed out the example of Gerald Ford as how he got into power. Well, you bring up an interesting play. This comes back to our topic of saving face, doesn't it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it's important. I'd like to have the yeah. concept of face discussed more and how important it is to them. So I'll, I'll go listening now. Great question. Her, thank you. Know, you. you know, he brought yeah, up thank you. He brought up Gerald Ford. And uh, Gerald Ford, you know, everybody goes, well, he was sort of, you know, the placeholder president, right? But, but, but a lot of historians now say that Gerald Ford sort of held onto the wheel when he, somebody needed to and yeah. sort of filled a really big role in getting the United States back on an even keel after Nixon. Well, mm -hmm. That's, why I, that's yeah. why I named my truck Betty. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, historians uh, look at that election and... Uh, you know, in 76, and if they had another uh, 60 to 45 days, 90 days, to maybe about, maybe about, it's about a month, month and a half of campaigning that they think Ford would have won. The momentum was really catching up, you know, mm -hmm. at the end to uh, 
uh, to Carter. People were kind of seeing the wisdom so, of his pardoning. Well, let's go back to that a really interesting point yeah. that Pierre Hart made, that um, this is all theater. Okay. I mean, does anybody disagree? John T., do you disagree with that? Well, I think he points towards something which um, I, 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 I try to keep a clear head about myself, and uh, I appreciate you guys doing the same as well, uh, is that there's the, um, the inflammatory news of the moment and there's the uh, the current zeitgeist and the, all of the emotions that go along with it. Sure. And we really shouldn't be thinking about what this means this weekend or next week. <laughs> we should be thinking about what this means three, four, five, ten years from now. That yeah, would be how. Yes. That would be how the three-dimensional chess player right. would yeah. look at it. And that's know. a very good point, Jonty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does they, how do they look at it? What what do you see, Jonty? Three or four, five years down the road. As a consequence I, of this, I see a situation where uh, it's in, increasingly um, uh, the the cost benefit analysis from the perspective of the United States is uh, increasingly sort of marginal with regard to us playing a role as the uh, uh, the, the policeman of the world. Uh, Taiwan is very important to the United States right now. It's going to be much much less important. Very soon. One thing I think is worth noting here. Remember, Nancy Pelosi had a trip planned to Taiwan a couple months ago, which she canceled because, as we were told, she contracted the coronavirus. After she canceled that trip, the U.S. passed the CHIPS Act, and then she was all ready to go on her trip again. Have you ever noticed how convenient this COVID business is to the, those in power in the world? It just yeah. seems like it's a perfect weapon to do whatever they want. Well, and Biden got it a second time. We'll see if he gets it four, five, six. I don't know how many yeah, times. There you go. Yeah. So the, the notion, I, it's going to be really e interesting to see. You know, we're in the, in the middle of this kerfluffle right mm -hmm. now. And the dust is flying and the rocks are flying. But it's really going to be interesting to see how Xi Jinping treats President Biden now. I'll, I'll bet Pure Heart was on to something. Yep. I'll, I'll bet we see uh, Joe, President Joe Biden taken out mm -hmm. one way or another. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you've heard it here first. Well, yep. look, the current Pope has floated the same idea that his predecessor did. Hmm. The, remember, the German pope retired. And, uh, and, and he came, you know, he I was... I think it was Austrian. Wasn't well, okay. He? Anyway, the European, remember him, he, he, he retired. And now Pope Francis has said, you know, my knees really hurt. I can't travel too much. I might, I'm thinking about retiring. Hey, I don't know why, you know, Joe Biden, how old is he? 80-something? Yeah. 79, something like that? Yeah, 80. Hey. Um, how many in dog years think, is that? I think I'll retire. But I, Pure Heart, I thought, brought up a good Maybe. point, though, about uh, saving face, because this really was a kind well, of a topic. See, that's this, right? what I'm talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I was trying to build on your comments, Billy, because they were really good. Um, the uh, notion of, of offering Kamala Harris something, you know, prestigious that she sure. could have some legs with. You know, going forward, offer her face to not be president. Okay, we'll we'll not be vice some. president. We'll yeah. get you know, bring somebody because right now she's Joe Biden's safety card, right? I mean, I think <laughs> there's nobody wants. <laughs> right. I mean, I would rather have Biden every day for president than mm. Kamala Harris, and mm. I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, well, she yeah. would be very amusing. Yeah, giving speeches every day. Well, I mean, it would be telling well, us what it would be wears. entertainment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. See, did you what guys did actually, Trump, What did President Harris say but I think, today? But I think if she got segued off to another job somewhere, resigned, that would be really tea leaves, wouldn't it? To what you're talking about, yeah. Michael. Well, that's going to be very interesting to see how this is played. I'm uh, sure it, that there are members of the Democratic Party who are trying to figure out a way to gracefully get both Joe Biden and the Vice President out well, of I the limelight. I think Xi Jinping will take care of it for him. Okay, well, on that note, we have a full board of people again. Let's check in with, um, uh, let's see, uh, Nick in Royal Oaks has been waiting the longest. Nick, you're on China Watch Radio. Hey, Nick. Afternoon. You know, Gerald Ford, President Ford, would stumble out of an airplane, and I would say he gained a gain face. Gain face. But um, I think we turn to look when we, when we uh, say we're with you, Taiwan, as we, we're just been saying because we've been with Ukraine also 
You know, it, it tears a look that the United States is strengthening the chips. I, without, you know, I, at this point, I was all happy. I was saying China is right now down eight missiles, but yet the burn is that Taiwan can is still in the embargo, out of the embargo, they can still send chips. And do we? And are we going to be worried about the chip losing the chips? The Chinese, they're they're fifty four percent. China and in Taiwan now. They've been populating for about 400 years because the, the straits there, they were too strong to now to, to really be a worry to Taiwan. The, the Malas, they were called Malas. They kept half Polynesian. Uh, and, and Maoris. Another, and, and they're the ones the biggest threat right now. The, the, they want to make us just know, everything just a flat out person, you know, take out the mix and all that. Well, uh, we appreciate the call. Thanks for the uh, the Comment. info. We've got things next. Full board here. Let's rock on. Yeah. Okay. Let's go to Gordy, who's on the next line down. I think Gordy, you're on China Watch Radio. Welcome, Gordy. Oh, your question is who was saving face and who wasn't. Uh, well, to me, it's obvious. Nancy Pelosi had to go to Taiwan to get a facelift. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. Uh, mean yeah. Gordy, mean. Oh, that was blow the <laughs> well, blow. Well, it, it, blow the skirt or something. I don't know. I mean, well, well I, they, they shut down all the. Uh, you waited all that time on the on the phone just to to lay that joke out there, well, didn't you? Well, you somebody, got us laughing. Somebody had to throw it out there. That was their main purpose: is to get a facelift, and now oh, that just fits in so beautiful. Uh, but the the big reason I wanted to call uh, this is on topic, but it's ancillary. Uh, the question was: Can we defend? Um, uh, Formosa, and uh, yes, we can. Right now, our U.S. Navy has realized it costs a lot of money to man our ships. That's the big expense. Um, and if we make these drone ships, we can crank out these drone ships. We don't have to have people aboard, which solves another problem. We don't have to put personnel in harm's way, and we can crank these things out uh, probably at a cost savings of 75% on each ship that we build. Because, again, the major expense in operating a ship is personnel. And mm -hmm. uh, you have to feed them. You have to have all those stores on board, et cetera, et cetera. And China can do the same thing, so we'll have a the Taiwan Straits filled with drones. Robots. Robots. Yeah. <laughs> robots. Robot yeah. war. Yeah. Yeah. Good I'd comments, Gordy. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Let's uh, check in with... Saving face with a facelift. Why didn't I nice. think of that? It was brilliant. <laughs> Dan in Live Oak is uh, waiting. Dan, you're on China Watch Radio. Hey there. Um, yeah, uh, you, know, you know what Joe Biden did right after his conversation with uh, Z? Hmm. What? He told Dr. Jill to hide all the matches because he, he doesn't want to be playing with the fire. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> uh, my, oh our audience is, is going uh, running amok on us here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that's pretty but good, too. That's pretty good, yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, as far as what happened, what happened last week, I, I don't think it's a matter of saving face so much as who's scratching whose back. You know, China's having its mm. problem with the banking crisis cash crunch. The Democrats are having their problem with, well, lack of credibility and being unpopular. So they're, they're kind of, you know, doing this song and dance to get their base wound up and, and supporting them, you know, to make it look like, a, oh, sure. it's uh, sure. it's Grandma absolutely. Nancy is not just someone that, that's sitting there eating ice. It's like, it's like Mary yeah. said, she's running for president. Are, are, you also, yeah. are you also suggesting that um, you know, so the Democrat Party has really taken a lot of hits lately with the gas and economy and inflation and so on, that they've got a couple of wins now on the international stage, right, with the missile strike of Skwari in, in Afghanistan and then Pelosi's visit to Taiwan? But, but, but I'm confused, guys. How, how is it that Xi Jinping would go along with Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi picking on him to save face and improve their own political situation. Well, that's what, that's what uh, Pure Heart was suggesting. You know, yeah. I'm, you think Xi Jinping is going to sit back? Yeah. I don't no, think he's not so. Gonna, no, I don't think so either. 
So I mean, I was, I was actually I was watching um, a, a clip on YouTube on, on the Epoch Time channel, mm-hmm. and there were well, it's a Chinese uh, channel, but uh, it was running through uh, threads of online social media complaining about the visit the visit and being so mad at the U.S. They're, they're getting the Chinese really pissed off. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So that, that kind of make them forget about their ATM card not working. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's mm. always, you know, that's very precise. Bait and that's switch. That's why Argentina invaded the Falklands. That's right. That's right. Bait and you switch. Know, yeah, the, the, yep, absolutely. Quiver when things are falling apart at yeah. home, go beat somebody up. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I don't think China really wants to go to war because it'll, they will have to show that all, all the pirated, uh, copied weapon systems actually have to work. You, you yeah. know what I thought about that, too? If China is forced to go to war or, yeah. or you know, show, show its force and all that, yeah. I think they might end up being shown up to be like the Soviet military was. That's where, right, Billy. Where, you know, everybody thought the Soviet military was, you know, bad you know, bad news, right? When it turns out, not so much. much yeah. Not so much. Do we All have right. any more callers? We had. We do. We. Uh, thanks for the call, uh, Dan. We appreciate it. Yeah, good, Dan. Let's uh, good end call. end our call uh, volume today with Gary. Gary, you're on China Watch Radio. Hey, Gary. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'd sure like your guest, including the you know your uh, Chinese expert, to have enough respect to give them their own email address. Your hosts are not contactable. You know, they, can, they can't be reached. I've got pictures here of Leon Panetta, who gave military and policy information, waving a, a, a banner of uh, Mondale, who was the vice president of trilateralist uh, Jimmy Carter, and uh, <laughs> Mondale calls for the non-armament of Taiwan. Uh, people need to know that Leon Panetta, for his whole life, has been anti, uh, pro, actually pro Mao China. There is so much information, and I can't get it through your guest or to your guest. I don't know who's in charge of uh, the controls of that, but I believe that all your guests, uh, through all the programs of KSEO, are, are host. Uh, be allowed to have their own email address so people can contact them without a filter. All right. Well, okay, we, your- we will see if we can facilitate We're something out of time. to that uh, effect. Thank you for the call, Gary. Sorry, Gary. Thank you all for office. tuning in. China Watch Radio, see you here. Same time, same place. Next week, who knows what will be happening by then. I'm going to be listening. And uh, just uh, check out ChinaWatchRadio.com. Uh, and uh, find out all of the information that we've been talking about in written form. And stay tuned for Flight 1080. It's coming up. This is KSCO Santa Cruz Salinas Monterey.